Assalamu alaikum. Believe it or not, the most important part about this segment is not the fact that we are revealing the unspoken fact that underlies the whole surah of Yusuf. The most important fact about this segment is that we are disclosing a practice that has been kept hidden from us by whoever decided to keep some information hidden from us about the Quran. We will learn about a spiritual practice that is extremely essential to the mu'minun, such as those who follow in the footsteps of Ibrahim. Inshallah, we will discuss this in full details at the beginning of the segment before we dive into the rest of the segment, which deals with the unspoken fact about the story of Yusuf. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي This is part 15 in the series on the story of Yusuf and in this segment we will reveal the unspoken fact that underlies the whole story of Yusuf This fact alone which is really unspoken anywhere in the whole surah but yet is a persistent fact that nags us to look for it really will explain so many unanswered questions in this story. So inshallah, we will see as you will see, I hope we will discuss it partly in this segment. We will continue discussing it in the future parts of this series. So inshallah, you will stay with us throughout the rest of the series and see how impactful this fact is. Remember, this presentation is not for entertainment purposes. So please take it seriously and allow yourself the time to really absorb and understand the information and analyze how we extract the facts and the evidence from the Quran alone. So yes, you are expected to do a lot of hard work to understand. And yes, you are expected to take notes, keep track of your questions. And inshallah, as I said, this fact will explain so many of the things that have been hanging so far. So in this segment, we're going to start with a definition of the term yajtabi. We're going to do a deep dive into this concept. We're going to explain what this means. And we're going to explain this spiritual practice that has been kept from us, or at least not necessarily emphasized to us as an essential part of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will talk about the unspoken fact, as I said, and we will present evidence that Yusuf behaved exactly and purposefully according to this unspoken fact. And we will also discuss the evidence that the siblings did not know something really critical about Yusuf. This segment is relatively short. We're not going to be able to dive into all the evidence. I'm giving you about maybe five or six in each category of these two categories. And inshallah, in future segments, we will keep reinforcing this concept and you will see for yourself how it fits everything throughout the whole surah. So inshallah, we get started with a reminder about ayah 12.6. We've seen this before in a prior segment. We're going to review it a little bit and then we're going to dive into the definition of this term. Yajtabika. So remember in ayah 5, Yaqub was telling his son Yusuf not to recount upon the siblings any of his opinions. And therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues with ayah 6, which is separated, not really directly connected to 12.5, but yet it is not separate from it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that Yaqub is addressing Yusuf in this ayah, but at the same time, Allah is addressing our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and perhaps addressing us, the readers. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وكذلك يجتبيك ربك ويعلمك من تأويل الأحاديث ويتم نعمته عليك وعلى آل يعقوب كما أتمها على أبويك من قبل إبراهيم وإسحاق إن ربك عليم حكيم And thus, through your spiritual practice of silence, we're going to describe this in a little bit more details. Your Lord shall make you someone to whose supplication he responds or whose supplication he dignifies. And we've described this a little bit in the past. I didn't really focus on it. And I told you I'll get back to this at a future date. And inshallah, we are getting back to it today. We're going to see a little bit more evidence. 
And then the ayah continues, and he avails you of certainty in knowledge, yu'allimuka, through the interpretation of discourses, min ta'wil al-ahadith, and he completes his favor upon you and upon Ya'qub's followers, wa yutimmu ni'matahu alayka wa ala al Ya'qub, kama atammaha ala abawayka min qablu Ibrahima wa Ishaq, just as he has completed it upon your two spiritual forefathers, patriarchs, before Ibrahim and Ishaq. Indeed, your Lord exposes evidence-based knowledge and provides the linguistic discernment. And therefore, by this last signature, by the signature in the ayah, which is the last sentence, Allah is telling us, pay attention, there is a lot of hukum, there's a lot of linguistic discernment you need to do to truly understand this whole ayah. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to focus on the word yajitabika because it's so essential. Most people, most translators, and most interpreters pass by this word without really giving it its due weight. It is a very, very heavy word, as we will see. So we will dive into it directly, inshallah. The concept of ijtiba, which is when Allah allows someone to have his or her supplications dignified. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches them how to do the right supplications and gives them the chance for Allah to respond to their supplications with all the conditions that we've been covering throughout this channel. This issue is primarily the most important aspect we have covered in this channel. So we are really interested in getting people to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the primary mission of a believer, of a da'i, of an inviter to Allah, to teach people, to show people that Allah is speaking to us and that He expects you and He wants you and He would love for you to communicate with Him. So inshallah, we will learn this concept and we will see with our own eyes how it started with Ibrahim and this is the essential aspect of the importance of Ibrahim. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ash-Shura, Surah 42, tells us in a long ayah, Allah yajtabi ilayhi man yasha wa yahdi ilayhi man yunib. Allah makes his, whoever wishes to be someone whose supplication he dignifies. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings to him someone by teaching him how to make the supplications so that the supplications are dignified by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember, we've talked about this so many times that the proper way of doing supplication is your proof, your evidence that you're presenting in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have toiled, you have worked the ayat, the scripture, the divine lexicon, and that you have worked hard to internalize all of these concepts, to cleanse your Weltanschauung, to work hard on accepting the truth through the Quran from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope these concepts have been seated deep in your core by now. Those of you who have been watching this channel for a while know that this is what we've been saying all along. So this concept of ijtiba, which we're talking about in here, is really at the heart of everything that we do. Everything that we use the Quran as a communication instrument for connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope this is clear. This is why we're doing the daily dua. This is why we've been encouraging you to learn the lexicon. This is why we've been encouraging you to connect alone with Allah, to take to Allah through ikhlas, become one of the mukhlasun, in order for you to really give up all your independence and become fully 100% dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And this is going to get you to this position, to this station of ijtiba. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us. So one of the principal objectives of Surah Yusuf is to teach us ijtiba through learning of the interpretation of discourse, learning the interpretation of the stories and the dialogues and the discussions and the conversations and the words that are included in dhikr, in the qasas, of the Quran. I hope this is all clear. All of it is so related to one another. The concept should be crystal clear by now. I hope it is. Please write me in the comments. 
Let me know how it's being received by you, my brothers and sisters, inshallah. So we do a little bit of linguistic analysis on the word ijtaba, ijtaba, as you see in here. The word ijtaba is derived from the gerund jabaya, jabaya, which means to gather, which means also to bring to oneself or to receive, to gather to oneself, to bring closer to oneself. So therefore this word jabaya is to bring to oneself. Ijtaba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, provides a way for that person, so that person is brought closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the essence of the meaning of the word ijtaba. I hope it's really clear. So now we see some evidence. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because we're limited in these segments that we're doing on a daily basis. But I'm going to give you two ayat and you can do the search using this root jabaya and you will see that they fit perfectly and beautifully and they explain so many ayat in a way that they have never been explained before, at least in our written tradition. And you will see for yourself. Please do the homework and verify for yourself and ascertain, give yourself this tranquility that what we're showing you is the truth, is what the Quran is teaching us to be the truth. Inshallah, you will do this. So this is one ayah right here from Surah Al-A'raf. وَإِذَا لَمْ تَأْتِهِمْ بِآيَةٍ قَالُوا لَوْ لَجْتَبَيْتَهَا قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَتَّبِعُ مَا يُوحَى إِلَيَّ مِنْ رَبِّي هَذَا بَصَائِرُ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةٌ لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ I'm only going to translate the first part of this ayah. And when you did not bring them a physical sign, remember the Jews, especially the Jews, those who are around the city of Yathrib or Medina, around our beloved Sallallahu were always nagging him and challenging him. Bring us an ayah, bring us something from the heaven, give us a miracle, show us that you're really truthful. And this is the limitation of how they were thinking and they were challenging our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When they did such challenges, they said, pay attention to what they say now. They're challenging him, they're mocking him at the same time. They're telling him, well, you are one of the mujtabun, one of those you claim are brought closer to Allah in a way that Allah dignifies your supplication. So make a supplication and bring such a miracle. This is what they're saying. So they say, why don't you receive such miracle, such physical miracle that they're asking for in accordance to your claim or expectations that Allah dignifies your supplication. So again, they're challenging him. They're mocking him at the same time. And this is the word, Unfortunately, it's been butchered and hacked in the translations and the interpretations because they really did not study this issue as we will show you in the next ayah related to Ibrahim. So this is the meaning of this word. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us that it is yours too if you choose to go in that route. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what to say in response to their challenge. So he says, say, O Muhammad, it is not what you think. Innama, remember we just discussed this word in the last segment. Innama, I follow but what is enjoined upon me from my Lord. I only follow the instructions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, Allah chooses if he wants to give someone a physical miracle or if he does not want to give him a physical miracle. We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave not just one, not just two, not just a dozen, but 6,236 physical miracles in front of us that we see with our own eyes as we toil on the Quran every single day. So these ayat are right there in front of us. If we engage the text, if we engage the scripture from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we believe that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not tell him, refer them back to the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to refer to the principle that we obey the enjoinments from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah gives us the instructions, we follow. We don't dictate upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what he should or when he should do such miracles. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses the best way to give us the instructions and the evidence 
to our own satisfaction. This is what the answer that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A beautiful way to engage this ayah from Surah Al-A'raf. Ayah 203 from Surah Al-A'raf. And now we get to the story of Ibrahim or at least a report about Ibrahim in Surah Al-Nahl, Surah 16, Ayah 120 and 121. إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ كَانَ أُمَّةً قَانِتًا لِلَّهِ حَنِيفًا وَلَمْ يَكُ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ شَاكِرًا لِأَنْعُمِهِ اِجْتَبَاهُ وَهَدَاهُ إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ I wish we would memorize this ayat because again these ayat have been butchered, have been totally misrepresented in the translations and the interpretations. And we will do a tafseel that will amaze you, but it's so beautiful and so consistent with everything that we see and will see in Surah Yusuf. Remember the word Ummah, we will see it in part two of the story of Yusuf, where Yusuf's ex-prison mate is described, وَقَالَ الَّذِي نَجَى مِنْهُمَا وَدَّكَرَ بَعْدَ أُمَّةٍ And the one who was released from prison, from among the two prison mates, and he was made to recollect after a while, بعد أمة. This is the word أمة. أمة in here means a period of time, specifically a number of years, as we will see in part two in the story of Yusuf. أمة. So أمة means a community, yes. But also the word أمة means a period of time, a relatively long number of years or a few years at least. So this is the context that we will see in Surah Yusuf. But here it's used in exactly the same way. So Ummah is not a noun. It's a temporal descriptor. It's a period of time. So Ibrahim was for a long time practicing spiritual silence for Allah. Qanitan lillah. We've seen the word qanata and qunut with the story of Maryam. And we saw the same word in many other stories that we've seen before. And I've been pointing out to you, telling you to practice spiritual silence. Spiritual silence means to literally not be accountable to any human being and to relate only to Allah, to be alone with Allah in your thoughts, in your words, in your hearing. All three aspects have to be given up for the sake of Allah. How long? As long as you can. How many hours a day? As many hours as you can. Practice it. If you can start with 15 minutes, just focused on one word or one ayah of the Quran and just talking to Allah in your own internal self, alone with Him, not having to justify it to anybody else, not having to explain it, not having to defend yourself to anyone else not having to show off to anyone else, just between you and Allah, seeking the truth exclusively from Him. That's qunut, in silence, total silence, spiritual silence. Yes, other practices around the world have used this type of practice, but why within the Muslim community this is not widely known is beyond me. I don't understand. It's really clearly mentioned in the Quran. And here, if we say that we are followers of Ibrahim, we have to practice what he practiced. So this qunut, qunut is not just a nighttime thing. It is a practice of spiritual silence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us he was practicing it for a while, for a long while, for a long period of time. And he was Hanif. We've talked about Hanif inclined away from the way of the masses. He didn't care about the masses. He didn't care about large groups or justifying or affirming himself through affiliation with large groups. Be alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Practicing silence. This is what he's talking about. وَلَمْ يَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ He was not who associated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was he doing? شَاكِرًا لِأَنْعُمِهِ Not just thankful. It's a lot more than thankfulness. It is communicating in devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on all the favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon him and therefore upon us. So we sit and reflect even on the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even this oxygen that we breathe as I'm speaking right now, without this oxygen, I would immediately shut down within a few seconds. 
This is a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gave us among the millions and millions of favors. The fact that I'm sitting on this chair and feeling confident that the chair is not going to collapse below me, that's a favor. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving me the eyesight and the ability to express and to relate to you and for you to receive. All of these are simple favors. We consider them simple, but they're really miracles if you sit and think about them. All of these are favors. So Ibrahim was reflecting on these favors and communicating his gratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the practice of spiritual silence. Really beautiful concept and so adequate for us to learn during this important time that we're in right now when the whole world around us is going crazy and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting us to take to him alone and practice the silence. Move away from people. Don't look to their approval. You don't need their approval. You need the approval from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what he gives you inside is this confidence, this tranquility that no one can give you. You cannot buy it. There's not enough money in the world to buy it. So therefore, this is what Ibrahim was doing. As a result, اجتباهو, اجتباهو, and this is the beautiful part. He, Allah, made him someone whose supplication is dignified. We saw this in other ayat. وَإِذْ ابْتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنَّ And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed Ibrahim using few words or using some lexicon, and Ibrahim or Allah perfected them, and then Allah told Ibrahim, I'm making you an exemplar, a leader for people to follow. This is what this ayah is showing us. It's showing us how he was making that supplication. Learn the divine lexicon through the practice of silence and reflection. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open his core, open his heart to receive all of these favors. I hope this is touching you and this is affecting you down deep, please write me in the comment if you feel it. And please let me know how we can move closer as individuals to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using these practices. We need to start talking about this within the ummah. The ummah has to practice this. We are so preoccupied with television and media and gossip and social gatherings and all of these conversations that really don't lead to the truth, to the real, which is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we practice all of these beautiful concepts, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only has one reward for us, to give us this special station of ijtiba', ijtiba' that we're talking about in here. All right, so now we go back to ayah 12.5. So ayah 12.5 and 12.6, as we saw, Yaqub was teaching Yusuf this concept of ijtiba. So what does that mean? That means Yusuf has to practice silence. And therefore, when we read, قَالَ يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تَقْصُصْ رُؤْيَاكَ عَلَىٰ إِخْوَتِكَ Oh my son, Yaqub is talking to Yusuf. Do not express your opinion. Which opinion? Any opinion. Don't speak, period. Don't say anything. Applying your concepts or your opinions, good or bad, against your siblings. So he's teaching him, you're going to think some bad things about your siblings. Don't express them. You're going to have some positive opinions or some positive information, some privileged knowledge. Don't express it. So what is Yusuf left with? Literally, silence, muteness. And that's exactly what happens. So we will see, inshallah, how Yusuf took this instruction and practiced it. Practiced it specifically with his brothers, ala ikhwatika. Did he practice it only for a limited time? No, he practiced it practically throughout the whole surah of Yusuf. And we're going to see. So this is the introduction to this concept. So Yusuf understood Yaqub's instruction to be a total prohibition to say anything to his brothers specifically. Listen again. لا تقصص رؤياك على إخوتك. Don't give your opinion. Remember رؤياك the way it's spelled in here. And we've discussed it before. Opinion. Anything you can think of, don't say it. Don't say it to whom? Your brothers. That means don't talk to them. 
That means pretend to be totally mute with your brothers. I hope it's starting to connect with you. So the instruction from Yaqub to Yusuf, together with Ayah 6, which we saw a little earlier, which is the concept of ijtiba, to come closer to Allah, to the point where He grants you all your supplications. This station is so desirable. Yusuf took it as the principal compass in his life, in his life regarding his brothers. So the instruction from Yaqub became absolutely sacred for Yusuf. So that was the clue for Yusuf to practice total spiritual silence, totally no speech, especially with his brothers. So as I said, the purpose was ijtiba. But now, along with the no speech, Yusuf started pretending that he was also deaf. He's not listening to them. He's not listening to anything they have to say. He's not reacting. So except for his father, he was not listening to anyone from that point on. So in reality, he was neither deaf nor mute, but he was really pretending or at least acting deaf and mute, especially, especially with his brothers. So now that was the start, that was the idea that started the issue and he was young and that stuck with him for most of the whole surah as we will see. In the next couple of segments, we will reach a point where Yusuf understands that he has given this oath or this commitment to his father to follow this instruction, don't speak to your brothers. And then he will see a sign that his father is giving him a signal that you're okay to talk to them now. And therefore, only after Yusuf received that signal, he started talking to them and he declared his identity to them. I told you there was a very significant reason why Yusuf refrained from identifying himself to his older brothers. Of course, the younger brother was not included in that instruction, as we will see. And that's why the younger brother has to go in alone, has to meet with Yusuf alone. And that's why Yusuf ascertained that he could declare his identity to his younger brother, but not to the older ones. And thus, the unspoken fact that Yusuf was bound by his obligation to obey his father and not say anything to his brothers. Not only was he pretending to be mute, but he was also assumed by his brothers to be deaf, especially by his brothers. Why? Because they've never heard him talk. They've never seen him talk. They've never been with him alone, as we explained in part two and part three of this series. So therefore, they had many, many reasons to think he was really mute and deaf. And thus, so many things become explained, such as in Ayah 58, when the siblings came to Masr, وَجَاءَ إِخْوَةُ يُوسُفْ فَدَخَلُوا عَلَيْهِ فَعَرَفَهُمْ وَهُمْ لَهُ مُنْكِرُونَ And they were not disposed to recognize him. Why? Because he was speaking and they were expecting that Yusuf is mute and deaf and therefore it could not be Yusuf. So they were not disposed to recognize him. I hope you're starting to see the beautiful connection. We're going to see more evidence, as I said, about five for both of the issues. So the issues that we have to deal with to prove this unspoken fact include at least two questions, very critical questions. The first, what is the evidence that Yusuf was pretending to be deaf and mute in front of his siblings? Are there signs, ayat, throughout the surah that give us this, where in reality he was neither deaf nor mute? And the second question is, how is it possible that the siblings did not know that Yusuf was only pretending to be deaf and mute? So these are the two questions that we will deal with in the rest of this segment. So the first question, what is the evidence that Yusuf was pretending to be deaf and mute in front of his siblings when he was in reality neither deaf or mute? So we consider as number one, the ayah 18, وَجَاءُوا عَلَىٰ قَمِيصِهِ بِدَمٍ كَذِبٍ قَالَ بَلْ سَوَّلَتْ لَكُمْ أَنفُسُكُمْ أَمْرًا So here the situation is, they proffered his shirt as evidence of what they claimed, that a beast devoured him stained with a fake blood or a lying blood or a blood related to a lie. 
And therefore, Yaqub immediately recognized their lie and said, Nay, no, yourselves have beguiled you into committing a corrupt undertaking. The answer was so quick from Yaqub. Why? Because Yaqub knew that Yusuf would have been able to yell for his brothers. He was able to yell for his siblings, whereas his siblings assumed him deaf and mute. And therefore, they're going along with the wrong assumption about Yusuf, whereas Yaqub knew better. And therefore, immediately he recognized they're lying. And he told them, no, yourselves have beguiled you into committing a corrupt undertaking. This is the first sign, so to speak. Let's look at some other signs. In Ayah 12, 20, it tells us that the human traffickers who took Yusuf were eager to dispose of Yusuf in Misr for a very cheap price. The question is why? Because they discovered something undesirable in Yusuf after they picked him up, which was that he was pretending to be deaf and mute. The question is, why was Yusuf still pretending to be deaf and mute with the human traffickers? The answer is because these were the corrupt associates of the brothers. In other words, if he disclosed his information against his father's instruction, remember, to the human traffickers, the human traffickers would go back and tell the siblings. So he did not dare disclose this information even to associates of his brothers. So he was still pretending with the human traffickers because they were associates of the brothers and he knew it. How did he know it? Because he was listening to the brothers as they were colluding and explaining to each other and coming to an agreement as to what will happen to Yusuf. He was listening to them. Another sign in Ayah 12, 23, the Reverend One's subordinate woman, Imra'atul Aziz, is described as having shed all pretexts. Abwab. We've talked about Abwab before in part one and part two of this series. She did not pretend, nor did she allow him to pretend, because she knew the truth about him, and he knew that she knew the truth about him. What truth? That he was only pretending to be deaf and mute. With whom? With the king. And that's why she rawadatu an nafsihi. She compelled him. She tried to compel him by using this knowledge she knows about him, that he was lying to the king, or at least pretending to be deaf and mute in front of the king. We're going to see this in part two. Now some of you are flashing this idea and all of this makes sense all of a sudden. She was forcing him. She was using this knowledge to control him, to force him to become part of her ring of spies, as we will see. So, she shed all pretexts. In other words, she exposed all her cards. She told him specifically, I want you to be part of our group. And we know that you have been misleading the king by pretending to be deaf and mute. We will see why that happened. But the fact is that explains that situation in Ayah 23. We will see this in full detail in part two of the story, which will come later in the series, inshallah. In verse 12, 33, Yusuf is quoted admitting that he was under the control of the conspirators, the conspirators led by Imra'at al-Aziz, the subordinate woman that worked for the king, the reverent one, and that he needed the help of Allah to avoid being forced to assist them. So in that ayah, ayah 33, he said, I will be forced to give in to their pressure and what they hold over me, which is the knowledge that I have misrepresented myself to the king, in front of the king. And that was a very dangerous situation for Yusuf. So he either had the choice of confessing, which he did later and we will see, which landed him in jail, or going along with the conspirators against the best interests of the state and the king. I told you this story is very sophisticated, very advanced in terms of its concepts and in terms of the information it relayed to our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what they held over him was the fact that he was misrepresenting himself to the king as someone who was deaf and mute. And therefore he had access 
to all sorts of secret information in front of the king. The king was speaking with his advisors, thinking that this boy, this slave, was deaf and mute. And indeed, Yusuf played that role very well. He continued to play that role in the court of the king, as we will see in part two of the story. So now we move to the second question. How is it possible that the siblings, the brothers, did not know that their own brother was only pretending to be deaf and mute? Well, there's a lot of evidence to this. First, in Ayah 13, Yaqub explained to the siblings that if they left Yusuf alone, then he would be eaten by the beast. Now, if you think about it, Yusuf, even if he was left alone, would be able to yell either to scare away the beast at Zib or to yell for his brothers to come and help him. So the fact that Yaqub was using this as an example, as if it's real, was telling us that the siblings did not know that Yusuf is able to yell or to hear. And therefore, Yaqub was setting the stage for the siblings to continue believing that Yusuf was deaf and mute. I hope it makes sense. It's really, really insightful of Yaqub. He was setting them up using their own false knowledge. And Yaqub was doing this for a reason, for a purpose. We will see this a little later, inshallah. And therefore, Yaqub was setting up the siblings' expectations regarding Yusuf's deafness and muteness, which they had no reason to dispute. Remember, we saw in part three and part four of this series that they've never been alone with Yusuf. They've never been away with him without their father. Yusuf, as a matter of fact, has never been away from his father, period. So therefore, they had no reason to know anything about him. And yet they were asking to be alone with him, which they've never done before, which means they really didn't know much about Yusuf. So that was one of the early hints I was giving you all along throughout the parts of this series. I hope you picked it up. And now I hope you go back and revisit and you will see I was giving you one hint after another all throughout the series, hoping that you would catch it. Inshallah, you will catch it now and you can go back and revisit some of the earlier parts of the series. In Ayah 12, 8, they use the term Usbah. That was another hint I gave you, which literally means a group of people who are deprived of certain information. And I gave you the example that means he made him blindfolded, depriving him of intake of information, depriving him of some needed information. So that's the word Usbah. They're referring to themselves as Usbah to mean faction or gang, but also the word as the Quran used it indicates that they were deprived of certain information. As a matter of fact, the verses 12, 13 and 12, 14 equate the siblings' expression, وَنَحْنُ عُصْبَ with Yaqub's expression, وَأَنْتُمْ عَنْهُ غَافِلُونَ You are unaware of some things about Yusuf. So Yaqub was telling them literally, وَأَنْتُمْ عَنْهُ غَافِلُونَ You don't know some things about him. And he was telling them the story about the beast and being afraid of the beast eating him while they're thinking something else, while they're thinking of the money, the profit they're going to make by selling him. So this understanding, as I said, is compatible with how we use the word asaba. Asaba, those of you who speak Arabic, immediately recognize this word. So therefore, they had some lack of information about Yusuf. And again, this was one of the hints I've given you before. In Ayah 12, 11, the siblings asked Yaqub why he would not trust Yusuf to be with them. And they added, وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَنَاصِحُونَ Again, that's another hint. I told you nasaha, nasaha means khalasa, which means to be in seclusion with someone or away from others. So they were asking for Yusuf to be alone with them, which means they've never been alone with him before. So they really did not know anything about Yusuf. They have never been alone with Yusuf. And in the presence of Yaqub, Yusuf was totally mute unable to speak because of the instructions that Yaqub gave to Yusuf. And in this note in here, I give you some additional information and you can read it and chase it yourself from Ayah 991. So therefore, now we have a solid reason to think that the Quran is giving us these hints. Remember, I've talked about the word Ayah before and I need to repeat it. 
The word ayah does not mean something clear. Ayah means an indication, a sign, a hint, a clue, not necessarily a proof. So the Quran is giving us all of these ayat, hints, signs, indications, pointers, look that way, think, reflect. But when you accumulate so many ayat, as we have done here in the prior page, right here in this segment, now the ayat, the signs become overwhelmingly convincing and we cannot dismiss them as coincidence. We cannot dismiss them as meaningless. They really mean what we concluded as you saw in here. The unspoken fact that underlies this story is that Yusuf was pretending to be deaf and mute around his siblings and later on around the king and we will see why. So thus, when Yaqub asserted that Yusuf was deaf and mute, as in verse 12:18, ayah 12:18, regarding the beast and eating him, they had no reason to think otherwise. And we will see more confirmation for this verb nasaha when we discuss the story of Musa and Imrat Fir'aun and all of these issues that we will deal with. Additionally, in ayah 12.102, Allah addresses our beloved وسلم, in the Quran telling him, and you Muhammad were not listening in with the siblings as they colluded, listening in, وَمَا كُنْتَ لَدَيْهِمْ إِذْ أَجْمَعُوا أَمْرَهُمْ Nor were you listening in with the gossiping women and the reverent ones, subordinate women, Imra'at al-Aziz, as they deceived, وَهُمْ يَمْكُرُونَ the fact that listening in on the siblings as they colluded clearly relate to Ayah 1215. Remember Ayah 1215 is when they accompanied him away from Yaqub and they were colluding. And we explained Ghayabat al Jub. They were talking about all these horrible things that will happen to Yusuf. He was listening in. And the proof is the rest of that ayah. And we enjoined upon him that you shall tell them about this corrupt undertaking of theirs at a point when they're not feeling it or they're not perceiving it. And that indeed happened as we explained. So that was ayah 1215. Ayah 1202 is referring to that scene, that same scene, when they're colluding. وَأَجْمَعُوا وَمَا كُنْتَ لَدَيْهِمْ إِذْ أَجْمَعُوا The same word, أَجْمَعُوا, the same marking between the two ayat and therefore Yusuf was listening in. Allah in the Quran is telling us that Yusuf was listening in which tells us listening was a very important aspect of Yusuf that he did without the siblings knowing it. Notice that the scene does not reveal anyone else who could have been listening in other than Yusuf. Of course they were colluding with the human traffickers and their corrupt company but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling our beloved, you are not there listening in. So somebody else was listening in without their knowledge, and that was Yusuf. So this tells us that the siblings were discussing their plans on the way to trade him as a slave in front of Yusuf. This fact reveals that they did not think Yusuf able to hear them. They really believed he was deaf. I hope it's becoming clearer and clearer. And finally, in Ayah 1217, the siblings returned to their father in the evening and claimed that Yusuf was devoured by a beast, as I said. And Yaqub quickly dismissed their excuse because he knew better. He knew that Yusuf would have been able to yell for his brothers. Now, finally, in Ayah 1258, the Quran tells us that the siblings did not recognize Yusuf despite him recognizing them. So the physical thing was not the issue. The issue is the siblings expected Yusuf to be deaf and mute. That's what they knew about him. There's no way for someone speaking to them, even if he looked kind of like Yusuf, except growing up now, there is no way that that person would be Yusuf. And therefore they were not disposed to believe that that was Yusuf. And this is exactly how we translated it. They were not disposed to recognize him. They were not even disposed to consider it was Yusuf speaking in front of them because they had believed that he was mute. This is the end of this segment. We're going to come back to this issue again and again. And you're going to see how significant it is and how important of an issue it is that Yaqub, when he remembered it, and he remembered the instruction he gave to Yusuf at the very beginning of the surah, after the siblings returned from the second trip, of course, now he gave them the instructions Go to Masr again and use your senses. 
Which sense is the sense of hearing? Because you're expecting Yusuf to be mute and deaf. No, you need to listen to someone who speaks like Yusuf. And when they did, we're going to see in the next segment, inshallah, they immediately ask, are you Yusuf? Immediately. So they changed their strategy this time because now they're armed with additional information that they did not have before. I've spoiled part 16, but inshallah you will continue watching inshallah with us and you will continue watching how the rest of this story develops. And with this, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who listen and receive. Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah laqad jaat rusul rabbina bil haqq. Indeed, they have brought the truth to us. I thank you so much for watching. Salamun alaykum.